We'll turn to Romans chapter 12, and we'll read just the first two verses there. This is page 947 in the Pew Bible. Romans 12, beginning at verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect." After the sermon, we will respond to the proclamation of God's word by singing hymn 50, stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 4. Hymn 50, stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 4. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, today is Pentecost. And I wonder if that sounds like a funny name for a holiday, especially to the children that are here. Pentecost. That is a, a strange word, a strange name. Do, do the kids here know what that word means and why this holiday then is called Pentecost? Well, it's actually a very simple answer. In Greek, the word pentakonta just means 50. So Pentecost just means 50 or the 50th. So the name of the holiday today is simply the 50th. We're celebrating the 50th today. And it's called the 50th because of its relationship to the Passover. This is seven weeks after the traditional celebration of the Passover. So seven weeks times seven days in a week is 49, and so the next day would be the 50th day after Passover. So today is the 50th day after Passover. The 50th day after Passover, Jesus Christ gave to his church the beautiful gift of his Holy Spirit. He had promised to them before that after he departed from them, he would be sending them this gift. He would be sending them the Comforter, his Spirit, to his people. And in that way, he assured his disciples he would never be apart from them. He would be with his people forever. Now, why is this such a wonderful thing to commemorate? Well, the abundant, overflowing, pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon and into the church is really the thing that makes the New Testament church so distinctly different from the Old Testament church. We have been given the Holy Spirit of God in an abundant and powerful way. This has caused and is causing miraculous transformation among and within the people of God. And as we read in Romans chapter 12, we are instructed there about our manner of life as the church, as Christians, and we need to be expecting to be able to live a life that has been transformed by the Spirit of God. We are instructed there in Romans 12 to present our bodies, that is our lives, our, our, the lives that are lived in our bodies, present ourselves as living sacrifices of thankfulness to God. And the question is then, well, how was that done? On the one hand, well, by not being conformed to the world, but instead, 
by being transformed by the renewal of our minds. Be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And this transformation is what is in view for us today on the day of Pentecost. God transforms us by the power of his Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful and miraculous work that God is doing in his church. We read from Joel chapter 2 a little while ago, and that's, of course, the passage that was quoted by Peter, the apostle Peter, in his Pentecost sermon. On the occasion of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter quoted Joel. In that prophecy, God was promising something, something great. He was promising a wonderful new time for his people. He was promising a new era, a new kind of life for the people who belong to him. So one of the questions that we want to ask with that is, well, what exactly was wrong or lacking in the old era? What needed to be changed in such a way that the coming of the Holy Spirit would be such a wonderful thing. Well, think of the history of the Old Testament church. What was the pattern that we would see over and over again? Well, again and again, God's people would reject Him. They would forget His ways. They would break His covenant. They would serve idols. They would serve false gods. And over and over again, they bore the consequences of that unfaithfulness. They were chastised, you know, very bitterly by that. And, and the consequences culminated in finally them being taken out of the land that was the home that God had given them. They were taken out of their inheritance. They went into exile. They weren't allowed to live in the land with God anymore. And so unless that pattern of unfaithfulness would change, well, then God's people would always be in danger of exile again. They would be in danger of experiencing that horrible shame of being rejected by God. Unless something changes, it would certainly happen again. Well, in Joel, God extends this promise of change. God promises that it certainly will be different. God will restore his people. He will rescue them from captivity, from bondage in, in Babylon. He will restore them back in their land. And he promises, never again will my people be shamed in that way. And God will be in their midst. And then... God will pour out his spirit. That's the culmination of these promises. The sending of the spirit of God upon the church and into the church, the sending of the spirit will be accompanied by miracles, by wonders. It's something that will be recognizable, unmistakable. And this will be the difference between the old and the new. God's people will be transformed by the Holy Spirit who dwells in them. And never again will they reject God in that way again. And so the instruction that we have from the Apostle Paul that we receive this morning, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. All of this is coming, and we know it's kind of obvious, it comes in chapter 12, the, tw the 12th chapter of Romans. It comes after 11 chapters of Paul laying out the wonders of the gospel of salvation. We're taught the wonderful gift of God's grace that he came to us when we were dead in sin. He came to us when we were in a state of, of helplessness completely unable to claw our way out of that pit back to God, but God who is rich in mercy has delivered us from death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul unveils these great mysteries of salvation, shows us how wonderful this gift of, of life 
and forgiveness is, shows us the beauty of new life with God, and he ends that section with this beautiful doxology, these words of praise and, and adoration for God. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or, or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And then our text, chapter 12. Therefore. So because of all that, because of such wonders of salvation, in light of all that God has done, in view of God's gracious work that he has carried out through Jesus Christ for our great blessing, in view of all that, therefore, Present your bodies as living sacrifices, not conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Since God has done all of these wonderful, miraculous things for our salvation, because of all of that, and in view of all of that, now be transformed. It's an interesting word that Paul has selected to convey this. Be transformed. Metamorphomai. That's the word that's used for this. Be transformed. Metamorphomai. What does that sound like? Well, of course, it's a very familiar word. It sounds like the word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. That's what it means. It's a, it's a radical transformation. What's one of the most remarkable kinds of, of metamorphosis that we see in all of God's creation? There are a lot of insects that go through this process. I think moths and butterflies are probably the things that pop into our heads right away when we think about metamorphosis. What an incredible transformation these little creatures undergo. They have a period of life where they are caterpillars, they're larvae, and then they go into a cocoon or a, or a chrysalis. They remain inside for a certain period of time. And after a little while, they emerge, and they are completely different. Completely different. A stunning butterfly comes out and unfolds its wings in this brilliant display of color. All this that was not there before. None of that used to be there before during its stage of life as a caterpillar. What they used to be, they certainly are not anymore. They are something new, completely new and different. That's metamorphosis. That is radical change. This is the promise of Pentecost. Something that transformative, something that radical. Radical metamorphosis, transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit in view of God's mercies, in view of all that he has done, that is, since he has accomplished your salvation in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, don't be conformed to the world anymore. Don't be conformed to the world anymore. That's what we used to be, or that's what we would be apart from Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, the world, what is meant by the world? The world is all who are still dead in sin, corrupt in all their affections and desires. Right? And, 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 and it's pretty bad. Jesus describes the condition of the unregenerate heart 
which is the condition of the world. He describes the condition of the world in Mark 7, 21 through 23. This is what, by sinful nature, what we're born with, this is, this is what is inside us. Jesus says, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. That is what the condition of humankind is. That's what is natural to sinful and fallen humankind. All these things come from within and they defile a person, says Jesus. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. This is how we are apart from the Spirit of God. And in that condition, of course, it's impossible. It's impossible to love the Lord. It's impossible to offer our lives to him as sacrifices of thankfulness. But God has promised radical change for all who are his. He has promised to change us into something new that we were not before. So what does that look like? Well, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. We read there, and we all... With unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, or beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. So the image of the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are being made more and more like Christ himself, whose Spirit is now in us. And now, I would encourage you to read also the rest of Romans 12 at some point later on for greater insight into what this looks like. And I just want to highlight a few things. Right, under, or right after the command to offer our bodies, our lives to God as sacrifices of thankfulness, being transformed by the renewal of our minds, Paul then shows what that looks like. And number one, he says here, and this is verses 3 through 8, it means that we conduct ourselves as members of one body. We are called then to identify the gifts of grace that God has given to each one of us and be eager to use them for the service of one another. If you have been saved by Christ and now are being, you know, metamorphed, transformed by the power of His Spirit, then you will serve one another in love. That's who you are now. And it ought to be something recognizable as, as quite outrageous, the way that we treat each other in, a, in the best possible way. Think of, for example, the, the loving fellowship of the church in Jerusalem right after, right after Pentecost, right after Peter gives this, uh, this sermon on Pentecost. The church grows not only in, in numbers, but grows increasingly together in love and commitment. The way that they loved each other, the way that they were willing to sell whole pieces of land, sell houses, and and. Share it with those who were in need. They considered property that belonged to them. I'm not even going to consider it to be mine. I consider it to be for everyone. Our service and care for one another should be outrageous. You know, and how, how can we learn how, how to grow in this? You know, maybe you just have no idea. Well, I, I want to do this. I want to be of service in the congregation. I want to love and serve my brothers and sisters here, but I just don't really know how. I don't know what the needs are. How can you grow in this? How can we all 
grow in this? Well, one simple way to, to understand this is simply reach out to your ward elder, your ward deacon. They can help you understand the gifts that you have and how they can be used, especially in, in your own ward. They know the needs that are there. They know who needs perhaps uh, extra care from time to time. People are going through uh, various struggles and, and hardships in life, and they can be a wonderful help for you so that you understand how your gifts can be used for the benefit and the well-being of the body of Christ. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. That's verse 9. How can we grow in that? How can we learn more and more what is evil and what is good? Well, by being diligent in the Word of God, learning Him, learning more and more who He is and what He is like, learning His ways, being amazed at His holiness and majesty, and the Spirit of God will incline your hearts toward Him. The Spirit of God will incline your hearts more and more to what is good and to teach you to hate the things that God hates and to flee from them. Do not be slothful in zeal. Verse 11. It's so easy to take it easy, isn't it? To relax and skimp on the things that we know to be good gifts of God time of prayer with God, time of devotion and worship, personal worship, family worship. These are riches of God that he wants us to pursue because of their, their great worth, for their, their, their great blessing for our lives with him. This is how we are more and more conformed to the image of our Savior by the power of his Spirit. Now, these are, these are things that are humanly impossible. None of us would do these things. Let's not forget that. The unregenerated heart will never desire to do these things. But the day of Pentecost has come. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. The Holy Spirit has been poured out here in us. And we must prayerfully and longingly expect that we certainly will see the miraculous effects of the Holy Spirit living in us. We are being transformed. We're undergoing a metamorphosis, like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. And this is the wonderful work of the Spirit of God. Let us be very eager to see how we are changed from day to day. Amen.